So my name is Kendall Wyatt. Uh, I am the instructional content strategist here at Picmonic. Uh, I'm broadcasting today from our Picmonic office in Tempe, Arizona, um, and um, I uh, I'm an R RN. Um, I started out actually as a paramedic before that, and uh, I'm in, in my third year of medical school, uh, doing my rotations here in the Phoenix Valley. So uh, one of the things is, you know, what do I do at Picmonic? And I work with our uh, content and obviously instructional content strategist. I'm, it's not a completely made up name, but uh, so I work with um, our actual educational content and I kind of am in the go between between you guys, the users, and our actual um, our team to make sure we have the most up to date content, that it's medically accurate, relevant, and work with our team as well as the rest of our scholars to make sure that it's, uh, it's the right stuff you need to learn. And I'm also kind of listening to what you guys say and put it all together. So Again, if you have any questions, you can type it in, um, and after this, we you can email us, and um, if we have something we can address, we will definitely take care of that for you. Um, that's definitely what we're here for. So um, with that being said, also in the background, I have Steve, um, who um, works here in the office and always makes sure everything um, is kind of kosher and working behind the scenes. Uh, we're actually inside of our Picmonic sound booth here um, in... Uh, uh, in Arizona, in our Picmonic office. So this is actually where all of our audio is actually recorded, and of course I have my mood lights behind me. So um, we have that as well. So we're going to go ahead and start it without any further ado. So what's Picmonic? Just really quick. And um, basically, we are knowledge mastery um, using images. Um, so we use characters, and we associate characters with things that you need to memorize, to, you can memorize it longer. Um, so everything you see today is going to include a lot of images to help you remember and solidify everything. And we give all this for free, but of course we have an entire product that's also back behind it. So this is kind of a snippet of everything we do. So anytime you need to remember anything, so like, a, you know, medic or um, diseases and things like that, and viruses, maybe like herpes, you'll see this herpes harp um, displayed in our Picmonic. We have tons and tons of medications in our product. We're going to go with lots of them today, but you need to know lots of things about warfarin. So we'll always show you this war fairy right here. And if you need to do psych, um, everyone loves a little psych. Um, if we displayed bipolar, we'd show a bipolar bear. Oxytocin, oct octopus toe, and of course pediatrics, we'll show you some type of little baby in there with this little cute baby right here. Of course, this one's supposed to be sick. He's got some green glow on him. So lots of characters that we use to help you memorize things because everyone knows, especially as a nurse, you have to memorize a thousand things, every kind of student, but we make that life really easy. We're going to go over concepts today. Okay? So we cover over 700 topics for nursing, um, all the things you need to know and to pass NCLEX and for your exams for sure. So what are we actually going over today? We're going to look at some renal system anatomy just really briefly. And we're going to hit on the path of physiology, renin-angiotensin system, the nephron, we're going to look at some pharmacology, and then we're actually going to look at a couple of diseases and um, some pathophys with those. And we're going to look, do a, a recap to kind of bring it all together. So what we really, what I try to really harness and push on these webinars is you need to understand the concept. And once you understand the general concept of everything on how it actually kind of goes together, then you can bring in the second piece, and that's memorizing everything. Of course, that's where Picmonic really rules rules the, the roost, we'll call it, um, to make sure that you know you have everything you need to know. And then at the end, we're going to do a Q&A um, for you so that if you have any questions, you can type it in. But of course, as always, you can type in as we go any type of questions um, throughout the way. So let's go ahead and get jump right into here. So one, one of the things you have to think of right away is all the whole body system as a whole. So if you've seen any of our other webinars or any of our other presentations, we have lots of them um, and uh, more to come, but we go over all the body systems. So we have one on the pipes, and that's kind of how you need to think about the pipes, these veins and arteries. They carry all the blood, right? And then you have the pump, the actual pump that pumps blood, and that's the heart, right? The aerator, well, that's um, these are the lungs inside of here. And I forgot to say this at first. We always think about the body itself. And it's this whole giant tank. And I teach about this entire concept of how it all goes together. You have this big giant tank, which is the body, and then you have the fluid, kind of like this big giant fish tank almost. If you imagine a fish tank, it's got, you know, blood, it's got water in it, and it's got, um, you know, the tank itself. It has aerator to oxygenate the water that's in there. It has a pump to move all the fluids, and then it has some pipes to carry all the fluid. Now, what we're going to talk about today, of course, is the filter. So if you think about a fish tank, it has a filter, and of course, um, that filter, of course, in your body is the kidneys, and we are going to talk about that today with the renal system. Um, renal system is definitely 
Uh, definitely a kind of a tough concept with lots of uh, little tiny tidbit facts, but a lot of medications that go along with it. And we're going to tie all those in together. And I want to keep referencing back to this whole concept of how it all goes together. Because we have a, a shock webinar we do, we have, and um, when you think about patient that's in shock, which organ goes first? Which organ goes first in shock? Which one do we actually have to worry about? Anybody know? It's the kidneys, right? That's right, Eric, it's the kidneys. Um, every time we have to worry about it, we have that golden hour of kidney perfusion, and then what's irreversible shock when it gets to that kind of level, and that's how we have to think about it. Because we think of this system, a large amount of the blood, 25% of the blood volume goes to the kidneys. Well, that's you know cardiac output because it goes together. So if I think about all those systems that I just put together, here's how you can think about it right here. Think about this whole system, and this is how you have to think about the body, all this passive pathophysiology. And if you are new, um, a new to, maybe you're just starting nursing school, um, you know, some of this maybe isn't as, you know, let's say easy for you to grasp right away, but if you've been doing it, um, or you are a second year, third year, um, then you can also kind of see how this goes together, and then you, once you know this, then you can talk about comp compensation, and, you know, when one goes wrong, the other one kind of picks up the slack. So if you have a problem where the blood is not perfusing well enough to the kidneys, well, what happens as a compensation mechanism? What happens? Decreased blood perfusion, before we get into it, what happens? What does the body do? Which one of those systems compensate? I'm just going to go back to it really quick. If low blood output to the kidneys, which one of these other four systems are going to compensate to help you? Well, two systems, right? The heart is going to increase its heart rate to increase cardiac output, but also vasoconstriction, i.e. hypertension, right? And you can get problems where it runs away and the system then... Um, you know, it becomes kind of like a runaway hypertensive machine, and we're going to talk about how we can block those with all kinds of drugs, and that's where you have to remember all this. So if we think about the kidney themselves, um, this is an image I got from Wikipedia here. You can just see here are the kidneys inside the body, right? Obviously, we have two, and we have a renal vein and artery comes in, and then we it comes in, and it goes through the nephrons at the, at the lowest level inside of these calyces, and then it dumps urine out the ure, uh, ureter. So just one little quick tidbit. What happens when you lose a kidney? If you don't have one kidney, does your, does your urine output decrease by one half? Duh, what, what, what happens? Anybody know what happens? You, you lost a kidney. Maybe you took out a kidney or you don't have one. That's right. Um, that's right, Viorica, is the other one compensates. And what happens is it actually enlarges and gets a lot bigger, and you have a larger kidney because it compensates. It makes up for it. And... It may, it, if you took somebody's kidney out today, let's say, um, you know, I take Steve's kidney out here in the office because I, I want to sell it in Mexico. We're pretty close to Mexico here. Um, I know that Steve's going to, you know, he's going to build up a little bit of, um, you know, problems at first, but eventually the other kidney is going to get larger and compensate. Uh, and it's going, you know, you won't have that kind of, you're, not, you're still going to be able to get rid of all of the, um, all of the uh, waste. So that's just some quick anatomy. And one thing inside of there is when all this waste is getting done is, and the hard pathophys part is the nephron itself. Um, the nephron comes in, and th this is a beautiful little nephron our artist drew here in the office. So what is the one thing you know about the nephron? How many nephron are there per kidney? I mean, is that is that even a high yield fact? I no, it's not. But how many are there? Let's think about that. Let's just talk about renal. Excuse me got the hiccups again, renal failure. Well, you know, there's about a million um, nef you know, nephrons inside of each kidney, at least a million. And um, what we see with ren renal failure is we measure uh, renal failure itself as it levels, right? Well, why do we not see any kind of problems, um, you know, decreased urine output? Why do we not see that until end-stage renal failure or, you know, in renal failure at the end? That's because the kidney still works fine with 500,000 nef um, nephron. It works with 300,000. It's not until you get down to 200,000, 100,000 to where you know, those are all damaged, and then um, you see a patient has decreased urine output because it can't compensate anymore. So there's lots and lots of nephron um, and um, nephrons. So what is, uh, just really quick, what is a disease that we think about right here that is destroying destroying the, the nephron, the glomeruli, what is the, what is a disease that we think about? It's just this one that's out there all the time. There's kind of two, but one I really want to hit on more than the other. That's always just how you're just uh, getting rid of these things. And you guys right away um, said both of the ones that I, was, I wanted to say. 
Um, Sanders has diabetes, and that's right. Diabetes. I always think of diabetes, um, and I always think about high blood sugar, and I think about any time I make a, uh, a syrup or you have syrup, it's full of sugar, and it's really thick. So you have sludge coming through these tiny little nephron, and that plugs them up, and they stop working. The other one, of course, is hypertension. And um, hypertension, of course, then causes damage because it stretches everything out and destroys it. It causes damage, um, and that's for sure. Uh, definitely what you need. De definitely two very important ones that kind of out there that ha happen with lots of people. That's why we need to control diabetes, and that's why we need to uh, uh, control uh, high blood pressure, definitely, for sure. So let's look at the nephron itself. We know that it has lots and lots of different pieces, right? So we have, um, over here is our, uh, uh, actually, I think I've, nope, hold on, let me go back. So we, we have all the different pieces. So we know in each one of these pieces, you may have to remember um, what gets lost and what's exchanged ion-wise in each one of these. Maybe you are at that stage and you need to do the pathophys. I'm not going to go through and actually help you to tell you how to memorize it. I'm just going to show you that you know we know the proximal convoluted tubule goes through, and we know that there are medications that work on each one of these. We have the loop of Henle, the thin and the thick ascending loop of Henle, and this little bullet dot needs to be up a little bit. But um, and then we have our distal convoluted tubule and a collecting duct, and we know that. Um, it comes in here and then it crosses back in, and, and the kidney, re the nephron reabsorbs, reabsorbs, um, you know, uh, the particular ions depending on where it's at. So here are our five pycmonics. If you need to memorize it, here are the five pycmonics um, that you really need to memorize, and that is so. If you see in the background, is the same nephron image. So here are the the pygmonics to help you remember the renal corp, uh, corpuscle, and the proximal convoluted tubule. So we'll actually show you this P rocks tube. And um, you can see it's kind of small here, but this is our actual pycmonic to help you remember that um, in here we, you know, you lose. Um, this is a, you know, a bicarb exchange point, and you come down to the loop, loop of Henle. You'll see these loop, and you always see hens every time we show you. And um, you come down here. We know that loop of Henle is where loop diuretics work, right? But it's where we have that um, uh, sodium. Uh, potassium chloride transporter, and that's where those medications work, and you can see that they're right in there inside that image. Um, and um, distal tubule as well, going through, and then the collecting duct. And collecting duct, of course, is where we have a lot of uh, free water that gets reabsorbed, right? So let's look at um, overall kidney basic function. And I, I, we're going to come back at the end and um, tie this back in with the medications on the nephron, um, kind of do those all together, because I don't want to get into renal pathophysiology, because one, it's it's not a very exciting topic. It's really just the fact of having to memorize kind of what goes where, and I'm going to show you how to do that, uh, how to tie it all together at the end. So basic function of the kidneys, right? Number one thing, these are, there are lots of functions, but we're talking high-level giant concept here, excrete waste. So we know they need to get rid of all the waste products, right? We know that our kidneys regulate our blood pressure, and we know they maintain the sodium balance. I mean, that's very important. They also maintain potassium balance as well. I probably should have put that on here as its own bullet point. And we know that it also works with blood cell production. So what works with blood cell production? Why, how does it make blood cell production? What is, what is that? What, what does it create? Lila says it right away, erythropoietin. And erythropoietin is made in the kidney, but what happens is it actually travels to the bone marrow and matures. It causes you know, red blood cells to mature, so then they can increase. So we know we have to give a patient who is in renal failure, we have to give them erythropoietin, Procrit or any one of those synthetic erythropoietin medications. We have to give it to them because they will become chronically anemic, right? You can't just give them iron because, yeah, they're iron, but they're not iron deficiency anemia. They're, they have a problem with actually maturing their blood, red blood cells and um, creating them. So that's kind of how you need to think about it. You know the basic concepts, so excreting waste. So if you don't have a kidney, what are you going to build up? Waste. What is the number one waste product that builds up when you need to think about uh, renal failure as a, as a whole? What is the waste product you need to think about? I feel like my forehead's super sweaty today. I don't know why. Maybe it's – I'm not even sweating, and I just feel like it's uh, shiny, rather, in this reflection. Ah, right away. So uh, urea. That's right. You guys, um, <laughs> right away, urea. Yeah, William says long sleeves in the desert. Uh, there are long sleeves, and in the desert, long sleeves is actually correct. Um, it was 104 degrees um, when I came here into the office today, so definitely, definitely um, – Hot. So um, anyway, so excrete waste. Urea is the number one thing you need to think about. 
um, and uh, we see uremic encephalopathy, right, with a patient that may end up in renal failure. And if you think about it, let's say you learn the concept of the renal system, the, the overall concept. This is what we're going to go over today, concepts. Then you're going to tie back to all these diseases or presentations. And I want you to always think about everything like that. If you understand how it really works and you understand it, then you should be able to reason through, okay, well, if I don't have a kidney, well, then I'm not going to be able to maintain my sodium balance. I'm not going to be able to excrete waste. I'm not going to be able to get rid of fluid. So I'm going to have fluid overload. I'm going to end up with uremia. I'm going to end up with um, retaining sodium, which is going to retain water, and I'm going to not be able to produ produce red blood cells. Those are all problems we have to fix, right? And we're going to talk about all those as we go through. So I thought I had a really cute picture on this one, but I guess I don't. So, so here is the renin-angiotensin system. And this is a wonderful graphic. I just want, to, want you to really understand well. Because one thing I know more than anything on the NCLEX is you are going to get hammered on, on the renin-angiotensin system indirectly. So yeah, you're not going to get asked to memorize the renin-angiotensin system as it goes, but what I can tell you is if you understand the renin-angiotensin system, not only are you going to understand a whole bunch of things, you're also going to understand how all the medications that you're giving actually work. And, um, and we're going to just going to quickly uh, go through it. So we've got some characters in here which are just for you to to have, and we're actually going to share this graphic with you today. This is one of the graphics that we are going to share, this one here, um, that we'll send out, um, subscriber or not, we send it out for free. We haven't posted these on our website yet, the ones we do for free, but this one is one we're actually going to send to you, and um, I actually believe um, Steve can upload it at the end when we get near the end for you, so you can actually have it right away, I think. Um, so I'm not sure if, I don't want to get quote me on that one. But we have it on our Picmonic, we will have it on our Picmonic website um, if you end up seeing this later recorded. So. Renin angiotensin system, right? RAS, raspberry system is what we like to call it here. So you know that the renin angiotensin system decrease in blood pressure, right? Which cells are a decrease, cause a decrease in blood blood pressure? I mean, which sense which what sense it? Well, in the glomerulus, right next to the uh, renal corpuscle, is you're going to see these juxta juxtaloglomerular juxtalo cells, um, definitely feeling tongue-tied today. Um, and you're going to see these cells, and what they do is they secrete renin. So we have renin itself, right? Renin. So renin goes out and releases it into the bloodstream, and then what does it do? It turns angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. So where is angiotensinogen made? Where does it come from? Where does angiotensin, angiotensinogen come from? Anybody know where it comes from? It comes from the liver. That's right, Cap. And you can see this little liver character. If you if you know Picmonic, you can cheat because we always kind of throw in the hints right there. See, these this liver throwing this rock into this angel gem, and that's how you can remember angiotensinogen. But here's the little the the part you need to think of. Ogen. Anytime you see anything that ends in ogen, it's usually a beginning product. It's a it's a it's a precursor. It's not a final product. Angiotens ogen. That's kind of how you need it. Is that always true? No, it's not. I mean, you know, but as a general overarching rule for a nurse, if you know ogen, you can kind of think of a, a beginning thing, you know, a, um, a precursor, we'll call it. Because we have angiotensinogen. What happens is it is converted by renin into angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1. So you can see this angel tennis player with this 1-1. One, one. Angiotensin 1. Increase angiotensin 1. It goes to where? The lungs, right? The lungs. And what converts it to the lungs to angiotensin 2? This is pretty simple stuff, right? Angiotensin converting enzyme. So we call it ACE, and we always show this little ACE card in the lungs because angio -convert angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, is in the lungs. And that's where it's converted to angiotensin 2. So what you need to remember here with angiotensin 2 is it's the most powerful vasoconstrictor in the human body. It's the most powerful vasoconstrictor, it is, or the most potent, and um, so it causes vasoconstriction. So angiotensin 2, you see this increased angiotensin 2 with these little tutus. So then you know next, and it's kind of simple, angiotensin 1 gets converted into angiotensin 2, you have vasoconstriction. So you see this vas vasoconstrictor here, vessel constrictor, this snake, va vasoconstriction. Angiotensin 2 causes vasoconstriction. And it also, the other thing that most people forget is that it goes to the adrenal cortex. So it goes to the adrenal gland and it causes an increase in aldosterone, right? Aldosterone. So here's a little aldo stereo here, aldosterone, aldo stereo. And what do you need to remember about aldosterone is that it causes 
uh, reabsorption of sodium. So if, it, if you have this increase in aldosterone, then you have this increase in sodium, well, what happens if you have a whole bunch of salt all of a sudden, right? You increase your blood volume. And I always like to, expl I always like to say this, and Steve always uh, puts his head down and in shame, but anytime that, you know, if you, um, you, you have been drinking alcohol, and you know if you drank alcohol after you're, you've drank it, you know, you're usually volume depleted. And I'm getting a message right now from Steve saying, oh, my God, here we go. Yeah, I did. And uh, so then uh, what happens the next day is you crave a salty type of food. You know, people, they say, you know, hangover food. They want this garbage, blah, blah, blah. But they're actually craving sodium because wherever sodium goes in your body, that's where the water goes. And that's kind of how you need to think about it. It's a concept. So if you overload somebody with a whole bunch of sodium in their body, are they going to be peeing a lot? No. No, they don't pee because where sodium goes, water follows. And you've probably heard that. I'm sure some people said that before, right? Um, you know, then that's where the if, – if you take a high sodium um, and you have a lot of high sodium in your body, then you're going to retain water. So what kind of diet do we put a cardiac patient on, somebody in congestive heart failure? What kind of diet do we put on? Cardiac diet, right? That's the obvious answer. Don't give me that. What does that diet consist of? decrease in sodium because we don't want these people to hold on to an excess uh, amount of sodium because if we give them lots of sodium, well, then they're going to have a lot of salt in their in their body and they're going to retain fluid, right? That's of course. So um, <laughs> um, someone said gravy as a choice. I, I'm not a big gravy eater, but um, perhaps gravy has a lot of sodium. I don't know. So increase sodium, and when we increase the sodium and we have this vasoconstriction, we increase the blood volume. Now, one thing that's important here is we have essential hypertension that's out there, right? You know, and essentially what happens is um, you have this runaway system. I mean, um, there are causes of hypertension, but the most hypertension we don't necessarily perhaps maybe know why, um, why it occurs. But what I could tell you is right away, let's say a diabetic patient. Why are diabetic patients hypertensive? Let's just think about the whole concept. I just talked about diabetes and sugar. I love sugar, by the way. And sludge. So if you have sugar and it turns in this sludge, then if there's a sludge blood coming in here to this juxta, 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 juxta I can't even say it today. Wow. Uh, these J cells, then um, juxta cells, then what's going to happen? Well, if they're not getting a lot of, if they're not getting perfused well, or they're getting a slow, sludgy blood. They're going to start secreting renin. So this kicks off this, this system because the, the nephron is trying to help itself. Give me more blood. Give me more blood. But what actually happens is then um, you're shooting the blood pressure sky high, and you see these people with really, really high blood pressures. So what do we know we need to do? I mean this is – you know, I get a – kind of get off on a rant here, but um, we need to – you know, stop this system from running amok, right? We have to stop it. And let's actually just think about this. So I, I taught you the pathophysiology. I reviewed it. You guys should already know this, I hope. Let's talk about the drugs here. So if you think about the drugs, and maybe you're not to pharmacology yet, or maybe you're in pharmacology now and you forgot about the renin-angiotensin system. Wherever you're at right now in school, it doesn't matter because this is going to be 100% applicable to you because you can come back to it. We're going to take the exact same system, and now we're going to put in all the drugs. So we're just going to quickly run through this. So we know that – and I'm just going to run through the system the way it goes. Decrease uh, decrease blood pressure. Then we know these juxtaglomerular – I, oh boy, I can't even get it today. Juxta cells. Uh, just really quick, one of the things we're actually hoping to do here in the office is um, having everyone pronounce medical terms because we make content. So you may hear lots of us in the, in the office – you know, we have audio recordings, and um, so we have to record content in this sound booth right here. But what you don't know is it's actually really hard for us as well sometimes to say these perfectly every single time. So we have some really good bloopers and um, some fun we're going to have with that uh, upcoming. I'm really excited about it. But juxta, juxta oh, Jesus, I, I, I can't even get it today. Jux, juxta cells. So increase in renin. Well, we know that there's a medication out there that's a direct renin inhibitor, and that's aliskirin and or aliskirin can't remember. I'm really not having a good day here with this. But um, what that does is it prevents angiotensin 1 or angiotensinogen to convert to angiotensin 1. It works right here. So we actually use this character for this alien skirt. And, um, you know, I was actually the other day I was, I was uh, talking to a patient of mine, and um, uh, I was talking to them about uh, furosemide. So furosemide is what kind of drug? Right away, what is furosemide? 
furosemide, furosemide, furosemide. A loop diuretic, right? So everybody usually knows it's a water pill or Lasix. And um, I was like, you know, the drug, it's a laser. And they're like, huh? I said, it's a laser. Because we use laser in Picmonic for Lasix, and I, I just I didn't even connect it in my mind because I'm always, always talking about our characters. And I, f I felt like an idiot, but I actually showed them our, our um, Picmonic app and Lasix and why I accidentally said that. And yeah, they thought it was funny, but they, um, uh, they really also, you know, understood it. So a we have this alien skirt here, but let's get in. Let's talk about the ones that you probably know more of because we act this drug we don't actually prescribe quite as often. There's lots of other drugs. So right here we have an ACE inhibitor. So ACE inhibitor. Well, what does an ACE inhibitor do? Ah, obvious choice, right? It inhibits angiotensin converting enzyme, and that's right. It prevents angiotensin. It, it's an ACE inhibitor, so it prevents angiotensin 1 from becoming angiotensin 2. So inside of Picmonic, we have an ACE card with these inhibiting chains. So one thing you have to remember all the time, lots and lots and lots and lots of drugs. You have to remember hundreds of drugs as when you're ready for take your NCLEX and in school and as a practicing nurse. But what is uh, one thing that you can do to save yourself tons of time, and we did a webinar last week on this, was farm endings. So what is the ending of an ACE inhibitor? If I know inhibitor, Biorica, I, I remember you from last week, so I know you've already you cheated, and you actually said my other, my next one too, and that's right. It's a prill. So every time you think about um, ACE inhibitors, you need to remember the ending prill. Lisinopril, enalapril, um, all of those prills are, are um, ACE inhibitors, right? And we actually will show you, here's a pearls on this little image so you can kind of keep them together for you. But um, you need to remember prills. So you can remember 25, 30 medications sometimes, especially like beta blockers, but you remember five or six, seven medications. And you don't have to memorize all the actual drugs. You need to memorize the endings. And there are always those outliers. And you know those that's what we have actual characters for, like our little alien skirt right here. She's just a cute little bugger. She's love her to death. So. Next, we have angiotensin 2, so we know after that, they may get the side effect of what with an ACE inhibitor? What is that side effect? I'm skipping over Viorica, so she doesn't say the I'm not saying her answer. You guys, right away, cough. ACE inhibitors could cause a cough because it inhibits angiotensin converting on enzyme. Um, but, you know, the mechanism is believed to be because of an increase in bradykinin, and um, it causes, um, you know, this, um, this uh, cough. And if you get a cough, a patient who's on a uh, lisinopril and they have a cough, you stop, tell them to not take the medication, you withhold the medication, but what kind of medication do they get put on? And that's an ARB, an angiotensin receptor blocker, angiotensin receptor blocker. So I already kind of got it right here, but we know that those are the next, the next medication. And what happens is it actually blocks angiotensin 2. An ARB is an angiotensin 2 receptor blocker, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker, or just ARB. That's why we call it ARB. Because angiotensin, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker is way too many words for people to say right away. We're going to put you on an ARB, or we're going to put you on what kind of ending? An, an, uh, a sartan, right? And uh, that's why we have this little Spartan guy right here, because for sartan, Spartans. And um, angiotensin 2 receptor blocker, these little angels, angel tennis players in their little tutus playing with these little blocks. Um, yeah, maybe a little overwhelming, because I... I feel like I'm going way too much into our characters today. But you can remember that sartans, spartans, arbs. And that actually blocks the vasoconstriction. And we used to not really give these medications a lot because they were really expensive or more expensive than April, but they're still second-line medications because they're not as expensive as they were um, in the last couple of years. And I, I really, uh, for sure, have to uh, stay up to that because you know they're not just not as expensive. So going into the adrenal gland, so we know that also we have adrenal cortex goes in and it creates an increased aldosterone, and that causes an increase in sodium retention, sodium reabsorption, right? So we we have actual aldosterone inhibitors. Aldosterone inhibitors. What kind of diuretics are those? Aldosterone inhibitor. We know they're diuretics, right? Yeah. I feel like I got you on this one, and that's because um, when you think of uh, spironolactone, spironolactone is a potassium-sparing diuretic. Well, it's actually, yeah, it's, you remembered it's a potassium-sparing diuretic, but you need to remember that as well or understand that the idea that it is a um, uh, aldosterone inhibitor, and what actually happens is, is it, it spares potassium, 
but it also um, it, it's because it prevents the reabsorption of sodium, which is what aldosterone does. What does aldosterone do? Well, aldosterone reabsorbs sodium and gets rid of potassium. Hey, potassium, bye. Um, so it reabsorbs sodium and gets rid of potassium. Every time you think of sodium and potassium, you should think about them going in opposite directions for the most part. Um, anytime you have, you almost always have a potassium-sodium exchanger. Sometimes you have a chloride exchanger in there as well. And what is a, uh, a uh, sodium, potassium, two chloride, ATPase pump? What medication is that? If I said that, maybe too fast. We think about loop diuretics. Um, just so, just so I don't have to. Yeah. Oh, right away. You guys, you guys said it, it's uh, loop diuretics. That's right. You think about that. Um, do you have to memorize all of those? Yeah, kind of. You do have to understand the general idea. Um, but you have to understand kind of how they work, and um, then you can you can memorize these themes. You don't have to memorize all these little tiny tidbits. You can memorize a theme. So we have uh, spironolactone, and we always like to show this spiral of milk. Anytime we have a, sp a spironolactone, spiral of milk. Now. We also have potassium sparadiuretics, but they actually are actually um, uh, they block the reabsorption of sodium. They don't work on aldosterone, but they work on on the sodium, and that's um, uh, triamterene and amylaride. So those are also potassium sparing diuretics, but they actually bo block the reabsorption of sodium. Not as high yield um, for sure. What you're going to get on you know you need to know right away are ACE inhibitors. You got to know that cough. Sartans, you've got to know right away. What is a very important side effect of um, angiotensin II receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors? Very high yield that you need to know. Very dangerous side effect. Sometimes my screen doesn't update right away, um, so to give me all the answers. Um, oh, it does actually look like it's kind of gone a little crazy. So. Um, yeah, it's teratogenic, but most importantly, angioedema. Um, you know, get those little lips, big swelled up lips, angioedema. And um, that's uh, also believed possibly to be because of um, uh, bradykinin. Sorry, I spaced out there for a second. So, uh, actually... Um, uh, Shan Chante asks about uh, what about thiazide diuretics? Does it block angiotensin? And the answer is no. Um, what thiazide diuretics do directly is they work on the distal convoluted tubule, and we're going to get to those in just a bit um, as well. So um, they actually work inside the nephron um, themselves. And these work. Um, this works. Other uh, all these drugs here work in other mechanisms because um, because we know. Let's let's just tie this together, and this is where we're we're actually going to this next. So we talked about, this is the renin-angiotensin system, right? And the adrenal cortex here releases aldosterone. But where does that aldosterone go to work? Where does it actually travel to in the body to work? Where does this increased sodium travel to to work? Where is, it, where is all that action happening? What's happening in the... It's happening in the nephron, right? Like in the collecting duct, and that's where you're going to see these medications in just a second. Yeah. So that's that's definitely that's how it works with hypertension with hypertension uh, as far as that goes. So um, next slide here. So here is the actual um, the actual nephron again. Let me just yeah nephron again. So this is the nephron. Now what we've done here now is we've added in all of the medications that work actually on the nephron. Um, so um, not as important for what we're going to talk about right now because we're talking renal, but proximal convoluted tubule, we know we have acetazolamide, this acetazoro that works on the proximal convoluted tubule. Does anybody know, just as a throw out there side side note, one, because I get distracted really easy, two, because I want to take another drink, what we give um, acetazolamide for? Acetazolamide. Acetazolamide. We know it works in the proximal convoluted tubule. What do we give it for? Anybody have any ideas? There's a couple good ones. Cats is high altitude. That's that's absolutely correct. What else do we give acetazolamide for? Anybody know? It's kind of the it's um we can give it for glau glaucoma. Um, that's definitely something we could do. We can give it as a uh, for edema and things like that. But what we do really importantly is that we alkalinize the urine with it. Um, because what happens is it's a carbonic anhydrase inhibitor, 
So what happens is it causes um, the body to become acidic and the urine to become very alkaline. Um, oh, shoot, I just went way real. Went like crazy on my slides here. It's big. I always hit this. I do this every single time. Every week I do this. So here we are. Sorry. Just ignore all that little buzziness that just happened. So um, proc that's what acet acetazolamide works. It works with um, carbon carbonic anhydrase, which is um, a carbon product. And we know carbon. Um, we're going to have an acid base um, webinar here in a couple weeks. But if I said bicarb and CO2, what is the balance? What is the balance between carbon uh, carbon dioxide and bicarb on a ratio? Does anybody know what that balance is? Is it 1 to 1, 1 to 5, 1 to 7, 1 to 10, 1 to 1,000, 1 to 50,000? Well, it's about 1 to 20 um, is the actual answer. So it takes um, 20 CO2 to really equal 1 bicarb. Because bicarb, I always think bicarb is juggernaut. But that's in a separate um, acid-based uh, conversation, uh, webinar. So we talk about the descending loop of Henle. Um, here is where someone said it earlier, osmotic diuretics. So anytime we give osmotic diuretics, you always want to think about mannitol. And we always show a manatee. We actually have a whole picmonic on this one. But what do we, if we're getting rid of osmotic diuretic, we want to think about it's getting rid of free fluid, free water. So we need to just decrease free water. And what, where do we give manat mannitol? I see I almost said the drug, the manatee is the drug name. What do we really give it for? Think about it right away. Eh, glaucoma, yeah. Mostly we give it for, excuse me, Increased intracranial pressure. Um, Alvin said, ICP, increased intracranial pressure. I feel like I've got the hiccups all of a sudden, so this is a little crazy today. Increased intracranial pressure because we need to decrease overall fluid um, osmotically fast, and that's where um, we always think about mannitol. So we come down the loop of Henley. Here we come on down. Here we are, loop, 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 um, all the way down, and we think about the thick ascending loop of Henley. And what do we know about the thick ascending loop of Henley? That should be very high yield. You know, Right away, you need to think of the thick of ascending loop, Thick ascending loop, I always think thick, I think big, and I think lots of fluid gone because I need to think of what kind of medication? Loop diuretics. Loop diuretics right away. Uh, Kimberly asked really quick, what medication is given for intracranial pressure again? And that's very commonly is given uh, mannitol. Mannitol decreases uh, intracranial pressure um, for sure. It could work for intraocular pressure, yeah, but mostly intracranial uh, pressure. Decrease intracranial pressure. <clears throat> like a uh, yeah, like a cerebral edema kind of thing. Um, yeah, yeah, cerebral edema. You know, increase intraocular pressure, increase intracranial pressure primarily. Um, IOP, yes. You know, ocular pressure, yes, and that is you know increasing glaucoma. So that is a good point. So the thick ascending loop. I think of the thick ascending loop. You know, you have to think about the thin or the thick. Think thick. Think big, think loop diuretics, because what we know is loop diuretics, I mean, they just come in, they just come in and they just get rid of everything. And what is the big loop diuretic is furosemide, right? Furosemide. And furosemide, furosemide has two really important side effects that you need to know. Really important. There are two. I can't know, I thought there were a bunch. No, there's two. You need to remember two. What are the two? Side effects. Two side effects of furosemide. If I said you can only pick two. Well, you guys got the ototoxicity, and that's very, very important, especially if you're giving furosemide IV in an infusion constantly. And when I say ototoxicity, what is my patient going to present with? When I say a patient is there in furosemide, what is it actually going to say? They're going to have ringing in their ears. That's right. Ringing in their ears is almost always a very high yield presentation when you're on furosemide. Ringing in the ears, going to be uh, furosemide toxicity. So I get lo I got lots of answers for the second choice, and I expected that because what I you know there are lots of other side effects of taking furosemide. Hypokalemia, very important, very high yield, but also hypocalcemia, hypo um, low chloride, all it gets rid of everything. And the one you need to remember second is that loops lose everything. Loops lose everything, but specifically, loops lose everything and calcium. So loops lose calcium. Loops lose everything and calcium. That's what you need to remember is that side effect because everything's going to be low. You're going to be uh, decreased 
potassium is almost always the first one, especially if somebody takes lots of uh, lots of um, uh, Lasix, furosemide. But um, you're going to see um, low calcium. You're going to see low chloride. You're going to see all of these electrolytes are going to be low because it just gets rid of everything. All of them are gone. That's how you need to remember. And then also um, uh, ringing in the ears, you know, uh, as well. So <clears throat> When we think about this, we know that secondarily we can give, after a loop diuretic, we can give thiazide diuretics. Thiazide diuretics, right? So a thiazide diuretic is hydrochlorothiazide. That seems pretty simple, right? Thiazide diuretic, hydrochlorothiazide. And um, they work on the distal convoluted tubule. So it's farther away, this distal convoluted tubule. And um, we always remember this, this hydrant with this Tarzan, man, hydro, hydrant chlorine Tarzan for hydrochlorothiazide. Oh, yeah, it's kind of a um, good little character to remember that it's on the distal convoluted tubule, so farther away. And what's the difference between um, Lasix uh, uh, or furosemide, a uh, loop diuretic, versus hydrochlorothiazide? What is the difference there? Big, really important difference. I'm not letting Viorica answer anymore because I feel like she cheated somehow. No, I'm kidding. And that's right. Why did I tell you that loops lose calcium? That, that's because thiazides spare calcium. So if you're in a thiazide diuretic, you may end up with what? You may end up with hyper a high calcium level, which um, which may end up in um, having lots of different problems, right? You retain calcium, so you end up maybe end up with a lot. Um, you can still end up with a low potassium level, a low chloride level, but what you're not going to end up with is a low uh, calcium level. That's not going to happen on a thiazide diuretic. That's for sure. So moving on to the collecting duct. We think about the collecting duct. We think about two things that work here, aldosterone, and we have free water. Not as much free water, but some. So mostly we have aldosterone that works here, and it, it basically, this is where we have all of our potassium sparing diuretics, all in the collecting duct. All of them are there. And we know, we just talked about three. We have this um, amelioride, which is amelioride, right? We have uh, triamterine, triamterine, this little triathlete, and those are what kind of drugs? Well, they're um, sodium. Uh, they work with a sodium exchange. So they're going to prevent the reuptake, reabsorption of sodium. So they're going to they're potassium sparing, but it's because they're sodium losing, right? They keep you from pre reabsorbing the sodium. And then we have um, spironolactone itself, and it decreases. Um, it's a direct inhibitor of aldosterone. So what is a side effect of spironolactone? It's really important. Sorry, I dropped my stuff here. Spironolactone. If I said, I'm going to give you spironolactone, what is an important side effect? And the, uh, the obvious one is not the one I'm looking for, I hope. You don't say that one. <laughs> Kat, Shante, and Hannah all, well, sorry, Kat and Shante said the obvious one, which is it's potassium sparing, so you're going to end up with a lot of potassium, right? You could end with hyperkalemia, high potassium. Yeah, that's obvious. Not the answer I'm looking for. What's that, another side effect? Well, um, nobody said this one today, but the answer is gynecomastia. So, you, uh, you know, you could end up with um, you know, you can end up with man boobs essentially if you take that kind of medication because it um, it blocks aldosterone, so it blocks this um, this synthesis of um, of uh, hormones, and it could cause as a side effect uh, gynecomastia. Yeah, you could. Uh, Timia says um, you could have a dysrhythmia, and that is true, but it's usually secondary because you had hyperkalemia. Because hyperkalemia, anytime you have an imbalance of, of potassium. You should be thinking about um, arrhythmias, especially hyperkalemia, hypokalemia. You know you're going to end up with arrhythmia as a side effect. So let's look at kidney disease, kidney damage itself. So we know we have kidney damage. Um, we have acute, so we have short-term kidney damage. So I talked about all this. We talked about the renin-angiotensin system and into those juxta cells. We could have acute, right? Acute decrease is going to be two causes, dehydration and hypovolemia. Hypovolemia, there's just you know shock. You have no blood pressure going to it. But then you have chronic diabetes, but also renal artery stenosis. So you have hardening of those renal arteries, then that's going to decrease decrease the amount of blood that gets through. Well, what happens? Well, the, the, you increase the amount of renin, you kick off the entire cascade, and the body tries to push a whole lot more between in that smaller little hole to get a more, more actual volume to the kidneys, and that, that's how you see 
and uh, this is always this is one of this this image here always makes me giggle. And this is our hippo for hypo uh, low blood volume, and he's taking a shower, so it just makes me giggle every time I see it. So acute renal failure itself. Um, acute renal failure itself um, has really three causes. So there's pre-renal. So this is uh, renal failure that's caused before the kidney. So you're not getting enough blood to the kidney. So what is a cause of pre-renal? So pre-renal, the, the kidney itself is not getting enough blood, but it's because it's before the kidney. Anybody know the example? Oh, I cheated there. Almost got to it. Trauma, that's right, could be trauma, so hypovolemia, you know, no actual blood. So if there's no blood in the tank, it's not going to get to the kidney, and that's right. And uh, a blockage somewhere could be true. Shantae typed a little bit of gibberish in there on her answer. I'm not, I think she's um, trying to type too fast, maybe. Maybe I'm going too fast for her. <laughs> but uh, um, that's, that's really right. It's basically above the kidney is a problem. So hypovolemia is a big one. And one, you guys, someone mentioned it earlier, but it's dehydration dehydration right away. And a very, 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 very high yield point is what is a number one sign, very initial sign you see in dehydration or a very early sign you see in dehydration. You're not allowed to say the obvious one. Again, you're going to cheat. I knew, Victoria it says thirst, and that's, that's, the, that's the obvious one. I, that's correct, but that is not what I was looking for. When you do your tests, they're not going to give you those easy ones. The patient's thirsty. Are they dehydrated? Yeah, probably. Yeah, they're, they're thirsty, right? No, it's the answer is tachycardia. So a patient who's dehydrated, they have decreased fluid volume. So they have decreased fluid volume because they're dehydrated. So which mechanism? Think about the beginning giant picture where we put it all together. If you have a decreased volume in your tank, well, which one of the systems is going to actually compensate? Well, the filter can't compensate itself. It has mechanisms to help it compensate, but there's if you increase the pressure that's there's nothing in the pipes to constrict so what happens is that tiny little bit of fluid you have has to pump around the system faster so you see yeah you see some vasoconstriction but you most importantly see tachycardia because the body has to fix itself and so it has to keep the cycle of fluid going around and around, and around so you can stay oxygenated that's kind of how you need to think about it to put it all together and you guys um yeah that's right you said the pump that's right so intrarenal, direct damage to the actual kidney itself. So some just causes in there right away, pyelonephritis and infection in the kidneys. You know, nephrotoxic medications. Which medication do I say? Immediately when I say nephrotoxic medication is every single old person on, and you should not, they should not be taking it for their kidneys. Uh, several of you said gen, uh, mycins, you know, gentamicin. That's true. You know, aminoglycosides are nephrotoxic. Um, but not really what I was looking for. The answer I was really looking for is a, with, think about big picture things. You know, um, and these are general stuff, and that's don't always go to the finite detail. Um, think about general old person. An old person probably has uh, you know osteoarthritis, and they probably take an NSAID, and that's where you think about NSAIDs are very toxic to the kidneys, and they you know you don't they don't want to be you don't need to be taking those NSAIDs every single day, and that's for sure. And of course, you can have a direct, um, any kind of actual other direct injury as well. So, post renal, below the kidney. So we talked about the kidney went in the nephron and calyces have circulated around, went to the ureter. So after the kidney, so anywhere the ureter down is urinary obstruction. So when I say old man and I say urinary obstruction, you say what? Not stones, not stones. BPH. That's right, cat. BPH. Old man. Um, obstruction, I can't pee, uh, prostatic, uh, it's always the prostate. That's right, right away. And, um, you know, they, they always, every single person, I always say, um, and I, I heard a urologist say this once, but kind of stuck with me, and it's pretty much, if you live old, live long enough as a man, you're going to end up with prostate problems. Um, you're going to have some problems because your prostate just enlarges, and it causes um, frequency and whatnot. Now, post-renal urinary obstruction overall in any population, of course, is, of course, urinary stones, and that's for sure, is, um, you know, renal calculi, kidney stones, going to come down, block block the ureter, ureter, and you can also have, you know, strictures and whatnot, which could cause uh, renal failure because of poor output. Anytime the urine stays and becomes, you know, it has stasis, um, you have problems with infection and whatnot that, that all uh, occur. So we talked about a lot of this already, but let's talk about people with 
uh, liver failure in general, and um, liver failure. Or I mean, liver. Fa uh, I went to the liver. I don't even know where I got that. Renal failure um, in general. We know if you have a renal failure, you retain waste products, and that waste product right away is urea, right? So if you have a lots and lots of urea, you could have uremic encephalopathy. Is a you know fine if you didn't you know long term. You're going to retain sodium, potassium, um, and you're not going to be able to make erythropoietin. You know general general things. We talked about every single one of these so far. You know there are other problems as well, of course. So chronic kidney disease. I feel like I need to sneeze today, but I just can't. I can't get a good sneeze out. I don't know why. Um, hopefully I'll do it afterwards. But um, uh, chronic kidney disease. So what happens in chronic kidney disease? Let's just think about through. Most, let's talk about a diabetic patient. They have chronic kidney disease, so they have this diabetic um, uh, glomerular nephropathy, and they, you know, long term they have kidney failure. We know there's millions of uh, nephron, and they end up getting damaged over time. They're, slowly they end up with this general malaise. Why do they feel bad? Well, they're getting, you know, uremia. They're getting this buildup of waste products. And if you have a buildup of waste products, I always like to think about it. You know, think about a dump. And I think every single one of you have driven by a dump at some point, right? And it's just gross. I mean, all that stuff sits there. Oh, or better yet, let's think about your garbage. No, oh, this is even better. So you think about your garbage. Now, I hate to take out my garbage. And um, at my uh, place where I live, they take the garbage every day, thank goodness. So I could put it out any night that I want. But let's say you do it once a week and you forget one week. So you have this bag of garbage, and it sits there, and it kind of, yeah, it's okay day one, but day three, it's kind of getting stanky. It's getting a little gross, and, it, you know, it's just not very good. It's just kind of, yeah, you don't really want to go near it, but it's not the best. It's not really super bad, but it's getting there, and that's how really how you think about kidney disease. It's really not that bad at first. Day one, day two, not so bad. You know, but it gets worse, right? It, it doesn't get any better unless you deal with it, unless you stop it, unless you get rid of it out of there. Now, with a kidney, you can't just get rid of the kidney, but you can stop the damage. And you think about um, things like acute tubular necrosis. So let's say I have a patient that has lots of NSAIDs, and they, they end up with lots of damage. Well, if you stop taking all those NSAIDs or you stop um, having all the, this pyelonephritis, this infection, they get better. Um, because they have this acute tubular necrosis, acute necrosis. Chronic, it just keeps going. And what happens with your bag of garbage if you leave it till the next week? It is disgusting. Um, it absolutely is nasty, especially if you had some hamburger meat in there that you threw away. Day one, the dog wants to get in it, but day 10, that dog is not going anywhere near it. Well, what happens? Well, you have kidney damage. Well, we know right away we have some compensation this nasty bag of garbage is not getting blood flow in there, so you have those juxta cells kicks off their system and says, "Hey, more perfusion, more fusion. We got to get this sludge out of here. We got to get things moving through." So you end up with the hypertension. Why do you have proteinuria? Well, you have proteinuria because as that thing, the sludge is going through, it's getting damaged, and when it gets damaged, it creates holes and it lets this stuff kind of flow through. Um, it just lets it kind of flow right out into the urine. Proteinuria and hyperkalemia. Well, let's just talk about hyperkalemia. Why do you have hyperkalemia? We talked about it. Maybe we didn't hit it on the head exactly, but we talked about hyperkalemia and the fact of, well, we talked about sodium and potassium, and if, and if sodium can't be reabsorbed, well, it gets lost. And if it can't be reabsorbed, it can't be exchanged for the potassium, so you end up holding on to the potassium. If you have a patient comes in, diabetic, uh, or I mean a uh, a, uh, a patient who comes in and they're on renal failure, in-stage renal disease, and they're on dialysis, what's probably going to bring them in in day five without having dialysis for a couple of days is going to be hyperkalemia first. Think about hyperkalemia or potassium itself as this really fragile little um, electrolyte. You know, it's got a tiny amount in the body. You know, the normal potassium is uh, 3.5 to 5, depending on exactly what lab you use, 3.5 to 5, but it's, you know, it's kind of fragile. Loop diuretics, poof, gets rid of all the potassium. Really easy for you to drop someone's potassium. But exactly the same way, if you don't have kidneys, potassium is the one that's going to build up the first. But also, it's also kind of, you know, delicate in the fact that the heart itself is very sensitive to potassium. Think about that as well. Think about potassium as kind of this, always this fragile little thing you always have to worry about. Because um, with you have a hyperkalemia, you're going to end up with arrhythmias. So if I have, if I said high potassium right away, what is the number one thing you're going to see on an EC, ECG? If I said high potassium, what are you going to see? How do you know some, that it's high potassium? Mm. Uh, 
Okay. What about the T waves? We're going to talk about T waves. High potassium are going to be these tall peaked T waves. And that's right. Um, tall PT waves. P tall peaked T waves. That's right. So mineral and bone disorders, again, because of calcium um, as well, you're going to have neuropathy. Well, you have neuropathy in general um, as well, but it's all because of these ions. Very often you have some of these chronic kidney disease. It's possibly because of diabetes and neuropathy, again, the same mechanism. Um, metabol metabolic acidosis develops. Why? Because you're not able to reabsorb bicarb. So we know the proximal tubule, we talked about what drug? Acetazolamide, carb carbonic anhydrase, we think, maybe, yes. And it, you know, you can cause this um, acid. You're going to have metabolic acidosis because you're not able to reabsorb bicarb or create bicarb. So you have these patients. Um, maybe you've done your ER rotation. Maybe not. I was a paramedic before. But one of the things we have if there's any kind of uh, renal patient is you give them bicarb in a code at the end. Or you, you know, give them bicarb because they could be metabolic uh, acidosis as well. So maybe a little too much information there. So let's talk about severe uremia. So severe uremia, CNS depression, yeah, you end up with this uremic encephalopathy because all this uremia, this waste, urea is the waste product number one, number one, number uno waste products, urea. Not so much in little bits, but really bad in big bits. You know, CNS depression, you have this really problem. Uh, but why do you have pruritus? Pruritus, what is pruritus? Pruritus is one of my favorite uh, characters, and we have it here in our... Um, chronic kidney disease pygmonic, and it's a gopher, I mean a, a prairie dog. Um, so, oh wait, oh it's not in this one, I'm sorry, it's in our, uh, this, we have two, uh, this is the early symptoms, we have a late symptoms assessment card, which has our um, prairie dog. So we have gopher for GFR, and we have a prairie dog for pruritus, it's a fun character. So anyway, um, so why do we have pruritus? Well, because when you have severe uremia, what happens is, it, actually, hold on, let me just, let me just, Read the answers here. It looks like several of you answered. Ah, Shantae says right away, you end up with this uremic frost. So what happens is you itch because the uremia, the urea, builds up in your entire bloodstream and all of your body gets that excessive bit and it actually comes out in your skin. You end up with this uremic frost. It's a, that's a nice word. Um, uremic frost. And um, uh, Steve's listening. I think we should add that word to our list of two-word things that make you, um, that are definitely disturbing, uremic frost, because no one in our office probably knows what it is, but it's a buildup of urea at the skin, and it makes you itch, and it's uh, definitely something that you see um, right away. So, um, just check, we got lots of answers here for this one, so I just want to make sure that, um, make sure that I go through. Yeah, that's right. So um, also you see edema. Well, why do you see edema? Because you're not going to be able to manage your fluid balance and get rid of fluid, and that's true. And oliguria, so decrease urine output. Now remember, decrease urine output is a late sign. It's very common for you to have a patient on dialysis that has urine output, but they may not actually be getting rid of urea. They may not be getting rid of things. They may produce urine, but it may not have any waste products in it because it's just you know, there's holes in those nephrons and the blood comes in, there's a hole and it just gets rid of some fluid and there's, you know, really doesn't function to get rid of waste products. That's kind of how you need to think about it. So let's quickly talk about dialysis really fast. We talk about kidney failure and, and whatnot. We know that dialysis, number one, major fluid shifts, right? Um, you know you want to monitor their blood pressure because you're getting rid of this fluid with a machine. You're on this machine a long time, especially with, um, with uh, hemodialysis and no blood pressure in the arm, especially with the shunt. Um, and every time you have that, that fistula, where you have the fistula, you're going to have a thrill and a brewy. And you usually ask this, but just because of time, I'm just going to explain it. So the difference between a thrill and a brewy. 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 Does anybody really know thrill and brewy? Well, a thrill is something you feel. You can feel a thrill. You can feel this thrill, and it's a pulsation. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. You can feel a thrill. And a brewy, you auscultate, so you can hear a brewy. So one thing, anytime you had, maybe you had somebody with, um, you need to do carotid massage on, like a supraventricular tachycardia patient that you need to create a valsalva maneuver, you maybe need to stimulate to slow down their heart, you know, the doctor may do a carotid massage, well, you want to auscultate for a brewery, listen for a brewery, and the brewery is a turbulent blood flow, so it's whoosh, 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 that you hear, so you hear it when you auscultate it, and a thrill, you actually feel, so when you put your um, fingers on that uh, fistula, you can feel the thrill. 
and um, that's just really about all I want to say about that just for now. So really quick pyelonephritis. I know we had some questions the other day on pyelonephritis um, indirectly and directly, but pyelonephritis is, of course, an infection. And one thing you have to know about renal is that all of those infections do what? Where do the infections come from? Almost every single one for pyelonephritis. Oh, hold on. Let me just, I've got a couple questions here. Oh, so um, Elaine asks if, uh, if it's normal to have a, a brewery and a thrill. And yes, that's what you do to assess um, an AV, in the fistula for, in a diabetic where you, you know, where you put the catheter. Um, you should assess to hear a thrill and you should feel a brewery. Um, that lets you know that it is accurate in the, in the, um, in the fistula. Now, if you hear a brewery, a brewery is um, essentially like um, a, a clot or something that the blood is going around that makes it turbulent or that, you know, it's a turbulent flow. So you don't want to hear a brewery in a carotid artery. That's a no-no. That's a serious problem. That patient probably needs an endarterectomy um, to go in and clean out all the clots. You'd not want to do a carotid massage on those patients. But in a fistula, because we've it's man-made, like we put that fistula in there, you want to have a thrill and a brewery, and that's what you assess for. Assess for thrill. I heard a thrill in the brewery, and it's good. So for sure. So pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis, pyelonephritis. So that's a pylo and um, pyelonephritis infection in the kidney, right? And um, we talk about here uh, pyelonephritis. We know pyelonephritis affections usually ascen. They usually come up from what? Well, they come up from outside, right? I mean, the bladder is sterile. The kidneys are sterile from the blood. It's not most common that a blood infection happens because it goes to the kidney. That's not true. Usually what happens is you have a urinary tract infection that ascends. Well, that means it goes from the urethral meatus. Meatus is one of my favorite words, by the way. Um, so anyway, not the urethral meatus, but you know, you have auditory meatus. Meatus is an opening uh, at all. So the urethral meatus, uh, Steve's going to give me a, a couple of interesting words for that one. Meatus is one of my favorite words. So urethral meatus comes up and it sends up the urethra and comes up into the bladder, right? And that's where that's where infections come. Well, if you think about how in the world is – Steve sent me a, a sad, winky face. How is an infection going to get up into your bladder, right? I mean, it's sterile. Well, the only way it's going to happen is if you insert something into your urethra up into it if you're a man. Now, if you're a woman – we know that you have a short, short urethra, a tiny little short urethra, but a man has a very long urethra. So, but overall, we know the most common cause of urinary tract infection is what? Well, urinary catheters. If you're inserting a urinary catheter, a very high likelihood of developing a urinary tract infection. And that's why anytime you have pyelonephritis, and inside of our pylo, this pillar kidney on fire, um, pyelonephritis, you're going to see an avoid um, catheters, this catheter cat, because catheters are a very common cause of urinary tract infection. So, um, and we want to avoid them right away. So, you know, you can also have this sepsis. So you can have sepsis, this sepsis, this snake inside the bladder right here. So you can end up with sepsis after pyelonephritis. So think about ascending infection. You're going to end up with, it comes up into the bladder. That's where the, the UTI, the um, uh, catheter would sit essentially. Into the bladder, from the bladder, up the ureter, in the ureter, into the kidney. From the kidney, where does it go? Well, we know we have that membrane right there. And what happens is it crosses that membrane into the blood, and you end up with septicemia, right? So pyelonephritis right away, anytime somebody has burning urination, you should think about possibly the fact that they might have a UTI, um, a urinary tract infection, a fever right away, flank pain, nausea, and vomiting. Now, if I had a patient and I said they have dysuria, burning urination, fever, and altered men mental status, altered mental status in an elderly patient, you're probably going to think that that patient has what? They may potentially be what? Septic because of a UTI. Because that UTI, and that, you guys are absolutely right, that UTI has called an altered mental status. You have an elderly patient with a catheter with, or an elderly patient with a dysuria, even with or without a catheter with altered mental status and a fever. You should think about definitely the fact that they may have a, a urinary tract infection. That's definitely on the differential diagnosis list. And if you're a really good nurse, you'll learn that as, as you go through for sure. Uh, my my stool today is a little squeaky. I don't know if you could hear it or not. So let's put this all together, kind of put it all together, the whole thing, and, and make it kind of recap. Here's our medications, right? 
So we talked about lots of things today. Urinary, you know, tra urinary everything. I mean, this is pee all over the place today. So we talked about the nephron itself and all the medications inside the nephron. Right. You guys, um, we have all the pygmonics to help you with that. So we talked about all these medications. Well, one thing you need to know is you need to memorize the endings of the medications first. So think about this. Here's just a list. Here's just a preview image of all the different medications. Not all of, but a, a snippet just to show you how many different medications you need to memorize. So let's just take this, this, these two right here in the middle. I hope you can see my mouse. We have this. Um, if I have this hen with this loop earring, a hen with a loop earring or a loop earring. Oh, sorry, a loop earring hen. You're probably going to think of a loop hen, loop of Henley. On side, on top of this die rocket, this die rocket right here, this little die rocket. Of course, our die rocket always shoots out a little urine out of the end just for a little added effect um, as its rocket fuel. But it's on top of this um, semi because ferrosimide, semide, right? Uh, ferrosimide. That's how you can kind of tie it all together. How you really uh, just remember that today is this loop diuretic ties it all together for you, and that's one of our characters inside of Pygmonic. But here's a really high yield one. I know we're not doing this today, but here's this beta fish, right? This beta fish on top of these blocks. So if I had a beta fish on top of blocks, a beta fish on top of block, and then I talked about a beta fish on a block, you think block, blocker, beta blocker, those beta blocker medications end in a lollipop, or Ha, ha LOL. Beta blocker medications don't end in the lollipop, but you could accidentally say that if you were talking to your, your instructor, and then you could say, hey, I learned that with Pygmonic, but I remember that this beta fish always is licking this really weird lollipop, because how many people have seen a fish with lips? Well, you've seen Pygmonic, you've seen fish with lips. And we have hundreds of medications, um, and all these medications here with you, with all these weird side effects, all this stuff you need to remember, it's all there, and definitely inside there for you so you can remember it. So let's look at, um, and one of the things, we have over 150 medications of everything we went over today inside our product, but let's just look, actually, here's a really important thing. We talked about this loop diuretics. So let's just quickly look at these. Um, Sana had a, a quick question about them. Uh, she thought the webinar was great, but she had a question about the medications again. And uh, let's just look at these. So here are actual picmonics for, for several of the medications we went over today. So let's just look at them. So here's loop diuretics education, or I mean loop diuretics. We talked about loop diuretics. What do they do? They inhibit, here's some inhibiting chains, on top of this 2-chloride, um, 2-chloride dispenser, 2-chloride sodium potassium pump. So right there, there it is. And the loop diuretics, and we know they work on the thick ascending limb loop of Henle. So you see this thick limb, limb here. And you see that they cause ototoxicity, right? Ototoxicity with these glowing green ears right here. And they're a sulfur medication. Well, that's really important, and we show this sulfur match inside there. Eh, side effect as well. So you have ferrosamide as well. And um, over here on the, on the right-hand side, all the side effects. And you're always going to see hypotension. Several of you said that today, and I, I skipped over it. But hypotension, of course, is a side effect of a diuretic. You can have hypocalcemia. You can't see it quite well, but here's a hippocal. And um, here's um, hypokalemia. So you can have a hippo... Um, hippo uh, a hippo in a banana suit for hypokalemia, and you can't see the banana suit, but it's actually a really fun character that we have um, as well. And there's all these drugs, so you ACE inhibitors inhibit ACE. You know, um, here's a sartans, a sartans as well right here because they they end in uh, sartan for the Spartans right here, these Spartans with blocks. And what's a side effect of angiotensin II receptor blockers? ARBs, right here, angioedema. Here's an angel edamame with these big old lips, and I don't know if you can see it right there, but they're there, big old lips angioedema. you see it. And um, you can see that. And then, of course, um, there are uh, other medications as well. And here's the beta fish again, which we talked about, which isn't renal today. So with that being said, let's put it all together really quick. I went way over today, and I don't know if it's just because I was excited or, or I was talking about um, um, way so much urine today, and just urine was so exciting. I don't know why it was such an exciting topic today, but let's put it all together. So let's, here's this wonderful body system that we talked about in the very, very, very beginning. So let's look at the body system themselves. So we have the, the veins and arteries, right? So here's the veins and arteries, these pipes all the way out. And the pipes carry the blood. So you know the pipes always, you know, they just move the blood. That's all they do. They move it. Any, any type of pipe. If you maybe, um, so I had a house um, uh, back in West Virginia that had 
really little pipes. And what I realize is that they don't move a lot of water. They're tiny little pipes, but they can have high pressure. And so you know pipes can change in diameter. So you have big giant pipes and you have little tiny pipes. But the pressure through them can change. So you know the pipes, and the pipes move the blood. So then you also have this pump. Well, you have to have a pump because inside of any type of great tank, if you said fish tank maybe, you need to have a pump to move all the fluid around. So here's a pump, this heart pump, to move all the fluid around inside the pipes. Well, it also goes through the pipes, but through the pipes it also goes through the actual aerator, the filtration, or the aeration device to put oxygen into that that tank because if you have great fish, you want to have these really healthy, wonderful fish, you know they need to be oxygenated. So we have the lungs for that. Now, you know that the lungs themselves can they can you can breathe faster to compensate, you can breathe less, you can breathe more volume, and there's a whole respiratory webinar we have on just the lungs alone to help you show all those um, lung pathology, whatnot. So aside from the lungs themselves, then you know you have the actual body itself. The body itself, maybe you if you if you lost an arm, so we took this entire tank and you lost an arm, you may lose a lot of volume and blood out of your tank, your whole tank, and you could have hypovolemia. Well, one of the things that gets a very large amount of blood flow is, of course, the kidneys. 25% of your cardiac output-ish um, goes to the kidneys, and the kidneys are the filters, and they get rid of all the waste that goes on, and um, definitely all the waste that just filters out, gets rid of all this waste. So let's think about it. The kidneys themselves have a lot of functions. So what you need to do to think of all of it together is understand the whole concept, the whole concept of it, what every single system d does. So if you have a heart failure, we have a heart failure webinar, of course. If, you're, if your pump is not pumping lots of fluid, well, then you know the kidneys themselves are going to respond and try to increase by increasing renin and angiotensin system. So what's going to happen? They're going to constrict the, the arteries. The veins and arteries are going to try to constrict all of it as much as possible, but maybe that doesn't work. So what happens is then the patient doesn't get very good oxygenation, so then you end up with a faster respiratory rate. And you can see how all these things help compensate, and that's just kind of how they work. They all go together because if the filters aren't getting rid of the waste, you can see these little yellow tubes here coming out, get rid of all that yellow urea, um, the waste products, then they build up in the body, and if you have lots of buildup in the body, kind of like you have a fish tank and you, you don't the filter doesn't work very well what happens it turns green and it turns this ugly mess of a green tank and that's what you don't want I mean I hate cleaning a nasty fish tank I mean everyone does you got to get rid of you got to take half the fluid out and get rid and put new fluid in and what's that called when we get rid of half the fluid it's called dialysis we take it out of the tank and we wash it and we put new in that's called dialysis and that's what you have to do if the filters aren't working, the kidneys aren't working. We're putting the concepts together. And if you if you learned anything today, is what you want to make sure is you understand the concepts. Understanding the written and angiotensin system is amazing. And that's exactly what you need to do, how it all works together with all that pathophysiology. But you have to understand the actual concept. Um, William asks, um, you missed the first couple minutes of this webinar. Is it recorded somewhere? So we're actually recording today's webinar, providing I didn't say any cuss words or anything too uh, graphic, and we're going to post it on YouTube. Um, Steve's rolling his eyes again, I'm sure. He's, I can't even see him, but I always get something. But um, uh, we do record them, and we post them on YouTube. So if you, we have uh, several of our webinars up there on YouTube. Um, our YouTube channel is Picmonic Video. Um, you can go view any of the webinars uh, that we have up there. Some of them um, we are doing over again with some new ones. I recommend you come to the live ones so you can see all my corny jokes not recorded. But um, um, we're going to put it up. I don't know how quick. We have to process the video, and Steve has to then send me a couple of mean emails. So it'll probably be tomorrow or the next day before we post it up on YouTube for you. Oh, Michael asks, um, what about this NCLEX study guide? So um, we actually have, uh, if you um, are getting ready to prepare for NCLEX right now, we have an NCLEX study guide. There are two parts to our NCLEX study guide that we have right now. Um, you can go to picmonic.com slash NCLEX or just click on resources and you'll see it under nursing. But um, there are two parts to our NCLEX study guide. The first part is actually helping you understand the questions. And one thing I need to point out, we have a webinar on Thursday this week. We usually don't do two nursing webinars in a week, but this Thursday we have a webinar um, for – um, uh, answering NCLEX style questions and pretty much what I do in that webinar is I cover everything that's in the NCLEX study guide in the first part of how to really understand some questions and how to really make sure you put your best critical thinking cap 
um, on to understand and get the questions right, or at least how, number one, not to add anything to any questions, and that's really, really important. But So that's the first part, how to answer the questions, how to go about it. And the second part of it is actually all the content that you need to cover um, using Picmonic. It has all of the, um, kind of all the ones you need to know as well going through them um, as well. So it's kind of how it, how it goes. Um, yeah. So CAT asks about our Picmonic of renal tubular acidosis would be great. And um, Kat, I would, um, let's see, I think we actually have an infographic on renal tubular acidosis that we have in production um, right now that um, isn't public, so it's actually going to be free um, to the public. So um, maybe I could send you that actually. Um, just email us at feedback at picmonic.com and I'll email you the infographic over because maybe you could double check it for us and see how it looks as a first pass because I just saw it um, last Friday, a first pass of it. So it should actually have a have some images. Um, it should be finalized for you to take a look at. And it's great because um, it helps you about um, uh, kind of a process of which one it is and goes through each of the different types of renal tubular acidosis. Um, mm -mm. Farina asks, um, she wants to ask me about lights, and I, I hope you are mean electrolytes. Oh, yeah. I know it's not relevant today, but I find it difficult to memorize all the lights by heart. Farina, I have amazing news for you. If you just go to Picmonic, um, I think it's the link is on our website, picmonic.com, and go to resources. We have a, an electrolytes webinar, an entire webinar, um, going over all of the electrolytes. I think I just did it a couple of weeks ago, and um, it will help you get those. I mean, we went through them kind of as some really great overarching tips of how to memorize them all as they go through. And then at the end, um, we actually um, we made a playlist for you of Picmonic, and we have um, like 18 uh, Picmonics just on all the electrolytes, hypomagnesemia, hypermagnesemia, and all of the things. And if you watch the webinar and you went through that Picmonic playlist, I guarantee you will remember them uh, because it really uh, you know, puts it all together for you. If you have any other questions, go ahead and send us an email at feedback at picmonic.com. Other than that, thanks for attending to guys. Check out our YouTube channel if you have any other questions. You can check out some other webinars. Have a great night. Thanks a lot for coming.